Hello, I'm Martin Doblmeier. Uh, this week marks the 90th anniversary of one of the more inspiring and I think courageous events in modern Christian history, the signing of the Barman Declaration, when in May 1934, pastors and church leaders from across Germany gathered in the town of Barman in the Rhineland and declared that their allegiance was first to Jesus Christ and not to the rising forces of Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists. Hitler had come into power about a year and a half earlier and had already put into law uh, laws against Jews, and he had already begun to take control of the Christian church throughout, throughout Germany, uh, demanding oaths of loyalty to the, to the new government. This is a topic of great personal interest to me, having done the documentary film on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And we believe that Barman is an important topic because it has echoes not for us today in our own contemporary America. So I'm joined by a really a well-known Bonhoeffer scholar, Charles Marsh. Charles, thanks so much for joining us today. Martin, it is a pleasure being with you today. I'm, I've been a big fan of your work over the years. Thanks for the invitation. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. Charles Marsh is a professor of religious studies at the University of Virginia down in Charlottesville, not far from us here in Alexandria, Virginia. He's the author of the acclaimed book, Strange Glory, A Life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Charles and his wonderful wife, Karen, direct the Bonhoeffer House at the University of Virginia, hosting countless students, faculty, and visitors every year as they build community and delve into some of the more thought-provoking topics of our day. Charles, can you start us off by talking a little bit about why this, what led up to the Barman Declaration? What led up to this gathering and why it was so critical at that moment? Yeah, the Barman Declaration, um, Martin, was drafted in 1934, uh, primarily the work of the great theologian Karl Barth. And um, since its drafting, it has served the Protestant world and, and indeed the, the Christian world uh, well as an inspiring example of robust Christian conviction and courageous dissent, a ray of light in times when the church becomes really nothing but an appendage of the state. In um, 1933, shortly after the um, ascent of Hitler to power, um, the burgeoning Nazi regime passed a series of laws that would hereafter uh, make it impossible for Jews to have employment in the church or in society. Um, and a principle of Gleichhaltung, or kind of coordination or synchronization of equalization began, whose purpose was to bring all of Germany's political, social, cultural, and religious institutions under the authority and control of the Nazi regime. And Bonhoeffer was among the first to recognize the extent to which this posed a grave danger to the integrity and the witness of the church. So Barman emerged out of those events of 1933, clustering around you know, a, a number of dissident pastors who felt they needed to speak theologically against the rising Nazi regime. The challenge is this whole notion of the Fuhrer principle, Fuhrer meaning yes. leader in German. And it's all based on, uh, I think it's incorrectly, but it's based on Romans 13. There is no authority except from God. And those who uh, have authority exist because it was instituted by God. Those are really potent and potentially very dangerous words when they're misunderstood. Absolutely. Within a few days of um, Hitler's appointment to ch uh, be chancellor of Germany, Bonhoeffer delivered a radio address on Ber Berlin's Rundfunk radio around this theme of the Fuhrer principle. And it's, you know, it's an extraordinary um, document. We don't have a transcript of the radio um, broadcast as such, but we have drafts of what he intended to say. It was, it was aired during the rush hour when, you know, the cafes and coffee houses and uh, salons would be crowded and people would be tuning in. And Bonhoeffer in this address offers a withering critique of the Fuhrer principle, as well as a really interesting sort of explanation of why it had gained so much um, credibility among 
German people. He he speaks in this radio address as a, as a pastor and a theologian, but you also hear echoes of the of the of the of the psychiatrist son in his sort of clinical observation, right, of the uh, situation at hand. He speaks of how German Germany's defeat in World War One had sort of um, had obliterated the kind of liberal Protestant optimism of the 19th century and the, the kind of congenial bonds between the throne and providence. And this how this present generation of Germans had come of age in an ethos of shame and guilt, of national shame and national guilt. So the Fuhrer principle enters into this void and in uh, a way in which um, the Fuhrer can promise not only to uh, make Germany great again, but to enact something like national redemption and salvation. And so the shame of Versailles, followed by the divine gift of Hitler and the rebirth of the fatherland, meant a new kind of salvation. Oh, that's fascinating. And we all, I think we often forget, too, uh, that Bonhoeffer, how young he is in 1933 when he's writing this and he's already in tune with what is happening. He's a young man that's, that's doing this. He, now, he's also not at Barman. He does right. not show up at Barman, as you as you write in your book. He was ill at that particular time. He does, in fact, endorse it. He signs the declaration, but he does it with great reservation. Why? Because he feels as though it doesn't go far enough in condemning what the Nazis are doing to the Jews throughout his country, throughout Germany. And therefore, he signs, but he's very, very disappointed. Absolutely. Bonhoeffer is living in London uh, at the time that Barman convenes and is signed. And, um, you know, so we, we, we need to, I think, acknowledge the complexities of the Barman Confession Though, you know, I would like, first of all, to affirm, as Bonhoeffer himself did, the importance and the um, power of the Barman Confession. I mean, you know, in his cl classic creeds of the Christian Church anthology, the historian John Leith includes the Barman Confession among the canonical creeds and declarations that formed, you know, the Christian imagination and the Christian tradition calling it, you know, a, a witness and a battle cry. In, in less than a week, the Barman Declaration was published in full in the London Times. And with, within another couple of weeks, it had been translated and was appearing in newspapers and periodicals throughout Europe and in the English-speaking world. It's a kind of um, expression of indirect subversion, if, if you will. That is, the Barman Confession was in some ways, a forthright and single-minded uh, affirmation of the Lordship of Jesus Christ according to scripture and tradition. The, 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 the document quotes you know, beautiful uh, passages of scripture to attest to the theme of Lordship. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but my, by me, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, it was bold as far as it went. I mean, when the Nazis heard this clarion call that there is only one Lord to be obeyed overall, they understood that that was an indirect, if not in some ways, you know, a, a, a direct um, a, a affront to the uh, claims of Hitler and of the state to be the speaking God's will to the nation. But at the same time, Bonhoeffer always believed that a doctrinal proclamation needed to be followed by a concrete action of obedience. And it was there that he had some reservations. Charles, is it fair to say that in the early years, um, as he's needing to build up a constituency, a following, a support system, Adolf Hitler courted the churches, made promises to the church leadership of their ability to have position of of importance and authority once he was able to get control. And then it's my my sense that once he got control, he left them far behind and in fact ignored everything else that was to follow. He, he abandoned the people who got him to where he needed to be. I think that is such an important part of the story and, and so interesting. Um, what I always find so exceedingly fascinating on precisely that point, Martin, is that 
while Hitler and you know the Nazi leadership sought and effectively used the Nazified church, the so-called German Christian church, to their advantage, there came a point when they realized that even this quasi or altogether heretical church that had sought, in fact, to dis deracinate the Christian message from all of its Jewish origins, even that Nazified church was somehow inescapably Jewish and that Jesus was inescapably Jewish and that a new kind of national religion needed to be forged, which drew then more on pagan and Teutonic gods and um, myth that all bolstered this kind of cult of um, Aryan purity and, the, and German essentialism. Mm. So whenever I do a history project, Charles, everybody wants to know, well, what does that have to say to me now? What, what, what relevance does it have? And uh, from my own point of view, I think that our country today is really at an inflection point. Mark Twain would say that uh, history does not repeat itself, but it's so often rhymes. And as, <laughs> as you look, as you look at what's happening in our country with a mindset to what was happening in Barman, what concerns you? What, what are you thinking of in terms of um, lessons to be learned, the relationship between the Christian church and, and when it had been a dominantly Christian nation of America, the changes that are happening in this country right now, and the expectation that political leaders may have in using and manipulating a church going forward? I mean, that's such an important question. And I, I do share your caution in drawing comparisons between our situation and the situation of the church in Germany. And because there are so many incommensurable political and historical realities, but I think there are important and similar theological lessons to learn. So I love to have my students read a late essay by Karl Barth. Barth and Bonhoeffer, you know, despite their robust disagreements um, were, um, were, were both theological geniuses and both illuminated different strategies for, re, you know, for, for trading on the, the rich resources of Christian orthodoxy to address social justice and the social order. And it's a little essay called Evangelical Theology in the, the 19th Century. And I think every, every Christian, every interested person might do well to sort of read this book. It's the last, it's a, it's a chapter in a book called The Humanity of God. And over the years, I've had many students tell me that, that this chapter kind of gave them a framework for thinking about precisely that question. If you'll give me just a couple of minutes, I can give you the summation of that and why I think that's important. If you don't know the essay, in it, Bart recalls a certain black day or certain dark day certain grim day in August 1914, when as a student, he observed 93 German theologians and writers proclaiming their support of the war policy of Wilhelm I. And on that day, Bart tells us, it became clear to him that he could no longer stand in the company of these 19th century Protestant liberal theologians because, he believed, the German Christian had come to the conclusion that the will of the nation and the will of God were fused into one, that Christian values and the Christian religion had gained preeminence over what is distinctive and unique in the Christian proclamation. He said that, um, that the, the, the church's complicity with the war effort, and he was thinking about his teacher, um, Adolf Harnack, signaled to him that the, that the religious elites of the German nation had given too much away to culture and politics, and that their campaigns had become a kind of end in themselves. And as a result, outside winds were, were brought in, that, that blew in, and, 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 and that, that sort of created this notoriously foul air, is the language he used. And, and as a result, fatal eras entered the church, and in the church, these eras found a home. Namely, the Christian gospel was reduced to you know, a kind of political talking point. 
the Christian gospel was reduced to a political agenda. And the God, you know, who calls the, the nations to repentance and forgiveness had become only a kind of guarantor of the aspirations of the nation. And in the end, the Christian faith had become, you know, little more that, uh, than a catalyst in these campaigns to make Germany great again. And so, you know, I think of Bart's analysis as I think of our own situation. It, it, it's, it's a situation in which, um, you know, on, 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 on the, in the political order, uh, there is almost a kind of um, absence of the language of the gospel and of the proclamation of Jesus Christ and of the mystery of uh, the Christian worship of the God who comes to us, not out of our own taste and prejudices, but from the faraway country of the triune God. You know, this principle of Barman, Lord over all creation, was also a principle of a, uh, an affirmation of, a, of the global ecumenical body of Christ, not a national church, but an international, a universal church. And, you know, it's it's that context within which I think we can see the eras of this new Christian nationalism, the eras of these political alliances that are being forged, and also just the careless and promiscuous way that, that, that so many of us have co-opted the language of the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's a fabulous point, Charles. I mean, I, I am concerned about the language as well. I, I get anxious about using terms like Christian nationalism. I just, I fear, I fear using that. But at the same time, I can't help but think that uh, there is a, a, a deification of political personalities. We're seeing that right now. A demonization of certain aspects of our culture, people within our culture who generally tend to be the underclass. Uh, the commitment to reestablishing Christianity as the dominant force in this country. And what I get most concerned about is the, thrill, the threat and the willingness to use force to actually I, I, actuate all of that. All those things harken back to a time that I think all of us need to be aware. This is not to say that there aren't values in each one of those efforts, and sometimes they're needed. But at the same time, they have to be execute, executed with caution and wisdom, don't they? You know, in the years um, preceding um, the election of, of Donald Trump, you know, I thought that however much disagreement there was in the Christian world in the United States, we all pretty much agreed that nationalism was uh, an ideal to be avoided because we had learned lessons from Germany and other um, such um, historical uh, cases. The, the, the language of Christian nationalism now, Martin, is being proffered unapologetically. People are writing treatises and manif ma you know, manifestos. What is a Christian to do? What is a Christian in the tradition of Bethel and Barman, of Bart and Bonhoeffer, of the confessing church to do in this time? I, I, think, I think Bart's drafting of, of, of Barman is, despite its weaknesses, the place to begin. And that is, bold affirmation of the Lordship of Jesus Christ over all creation, the affirmation of the global ecumenical church, the cost of discipleship to Jesus Christ, the new world of the gospel, the um, obedience to the Lord who comes to us from a far away country of the triune God, a, a, a chastening of our colossal self-righteousness and presumption to speak the word of God uh, on behalf of our own political preferences. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the, one of the lessons of Barman is that sometimes the historic reality is crystal clear in that it forces you to make a decision, to take a side. Uh, we, that puts us all at risk, but sometimes you have to do it. You just have to make a choice. So on behalf of, I've enjoyed this so much, Charles Marsh, on behalf of all the people who've had a chance to enjoy this as well, I just want to say thank you. We have to keep the conversation going. I would love that very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you this afternoon, Martin.